So today I'm taking a look at the GMK Tech K10 mini PC. Now this might look a little bit on the large side for a mini PC. I mean, it's not that big, but it's bigger than some of the other stuff I look at. And that's because this guy is packing. He's got an Intel Core i9-13900HK. So 13th gen i9 class mobile CPU paired with 32 gigs of DDR5 and three M.2 SSD slots, two of which operate at Gen 4. Wicked fast. So this guy is certainly packing a punch for his size. And if you're interested in seeing how it performs and the hardware specs, then come along on this adventure. Quick disclosure, GMK Tech sent me this unit for review. No money changed hands, they don't have any editorial control, and they will not see this video until you do. So, come along. Got the unit here in the sealed retail box. Take a look what's inside. And there we go. That actually looks relatively nice. I like the green accent here. This is metal. So we've got a mesh for ventilation. Got a core i9 sticker, because this guy is pretty baller. Front two, we've got some green going on, two USB 3, two USB 2, and a Type-C, headphone jack, and power button. Flipping it over to the back, we got a whole lot more Ethernet, HDMI, two of them, display port, two more Type-2, two, two more Type-3, COM port, I like that, but you probably won't, antennas for Wi-Fi, this is removable, I'll figure out why in a sec, and uh, ventilation. At the bottom, we've got some sort of screw. This is probably for accessing memory. I mean, you could put a Phillips in here. Could put a Phillips in there, but it's also got a, uh, a little handle if I can flip that thing up. Okay, I can't get this, so I'm just going to use a screwdriver. Up. Come on, come on out. There we go. So we have got the internal bays. Looks like on the internal days we got three NVMe 2280s. So they have pre-populated with one single PCIe Gen 4 SSD. We'll see what link speeds these guys are all running at. Down here we've got our two DDR5 memory slots. So that gets us two full channels. These guys are running without ECC because I can tell there's eight chips on the board instead of 10. And this memory is DDR5 5600 16 gigs on this stick, so that would mean we get two sticks, we got 32 gigs. Now I'm gonna do a full teardown of this guy after I've been testing it, but first let's boot up into Linux and see what the hardware topology is like. So I got my USB KVM set up again, hooked up with PowerBrick. I've got 10 gig Ethernet, this guy only supports 2.5 gig, but still got 10 gig switch. Hooked up to HDMI, I use USB 2 for the keyboard and mouse because I find the BIOS likes that better. And I've got Ubuntu. So we're going to boot up Ubuntu. So here we are in the BIOS. You can see we got the uh, Intel Raptor Lake i9-13900HK. So I'm up and into Ubuntu. And the first thing I want to figure out is where did all the PCIe lines go? Now, this is not an N100. This is a 13900HK. So there's a lot more PCIe bandwidth to go around than a lot of these mini PCs. But they still have to figure out where to send it. So broadly speaking, so we have Micron Technology. NVMe, that's a good company. And then down here we have Realtek RTL 8125 2.5 gig. And this guy is a serial adapter. I am a little bit curious about the choice to put a serial adapter in this PC. Now many mini PCs, especially the fanless kind, are great for industrial applications. You're trying to replace some PC that's like 20 years old, or you're trying to talk to some old equipment that's like 20 years old that speaks RS-232. RS-232 is great for that. However, this is an i9-13900K. I don't know what kind of software you're going to be running that needs this kind of performance and also needs a serial port. So I would probably choose a lower end unit if I had a need for a serial port. But uh, I like serial ports. Well, also, we're using the uh, Intel proprietary CNVI for Wi-Fi. So CNVI is the Intel proprietary link between the Wi-Fi card and the CPU instead of using PCI Express like a normal person. So I blame Intel for their proprietary bullshit. But uh, this guy comes with an AX201, which is the CNVI Wi-Fi 6 card. That's not 6 e so that's not 6 gigahertz, but it's still a good card. As for the SSD, it shows up as Micron Technology, DRAM list, that totally makes sense. 
So this chipset supports 16 giga transfers by four lanes, and it's running at 16 giga transfers by four lanes. That's PCIe Gen 4. Now the PCIe topology shows a Thunderbolt controller here, but GMK Tech did not advertise Thunderbolt support. So for some reason, that Thunderbolt controller is on basically every Intel chip. And I don't know if Intel disables it for some models or how this works, but I'm gonna try plugging it in and see what happens. Okay, so as I thought, we found the device as a super speed or USB 3 device. It's my MacBook Air, but it doesn't go any further, so no Thunderbolt. So I got a pair of these Samsung 980 Pros. These are PCIe Gen 4 by four lanes. So I'm putting them in the extra slots here to see what bandwidth these are. I love this easy access cover too. Even if the like handheld screw really needs a screwdriver, it's one screw access is very nice. Okay, Samsung Electronics. We are running at PCIe Gen 4 by four. That is sweet. And our last drive, that guy is running at Gen 3 by two lanes. That makes sense. So since Intel calls this an i9, it's still a mobile CPU. It still doesn't have a ton of PCIe lanes to go around. So we've got eight lanes at Gen 4 that go to our two M.2s. And so our third M.2 gets two lanes of Gen 3. I think it's a very reasonable trade-off, especially because two M.2s at Gen 4 by four lanes is wicked fast. No, 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 you're not allowed to check for updates. Stop it. Stop it. Do you guys hate dealing with Microsoft too? Because this guy is like kind of powerful, I want to try to run some gaming benchmarks on him. Normally I wouldn't imagine you using like an N100 for gaming, but uh, 13900 HK, that, um, that's quite a bit of a different story. But unfortunately that requires Windows, and uh, I'm going to deal with all this bullshit here. I accidentally left it plugged in, so now it downloaded updates and it's having a bad time. Sit back and relax while the magic happens. So up first, I've got 3D Mark Time Spy. Now this is not Time Spy Extreme. This is just regular Time Spy, but uh, it seems to be running okay. This is again, integrated graphics after all. They are relatively good integrated graphics, but they're still integrated graphics on a mobile CPU and the GPU graphics is limited to 15 watts. So it's only so much we can expect here. Also running this benchmark, we're pulling about 50 watts. This benchmark's been running for over a minute now, so we're probably out of the peak period. But 50 watts at the wall, and we're running times by. So we got a score of 2131, which is not bad. It gave our CPU quite a good score here at 10,521, and our graphics down at only 1,869. And even though Time Spy makes a great comparison to dedicated cards, it's not entirely fair to run an integrated graphics test and expect good performance on it. So I'm also running the integrated graphics benchmark, Night Rate. So now in the CPU test section, where it's going to load the CPU a lot more, we are pulling a whopping 79 watts at the wall from this guy. I don't know if you can hear his fan, but his fan is certainly doing some work here. Um, I mean, there's pretty hot air coming out. It doesn't feel unusual. It's not annoying, but there's certainly a fan in there. And our result of 21,491, graphics score of 24,683, and CPU score of 12,404. Okay, guys. So I am kind of riding the struggle bus here. So I thought that since this is a core i9, 13900HK, and the i9 should be like the best of what Intel makes in that generation, at least for mobile, that maybe it could do some VR gaming. So VR gaming traditionally has been very hard even for discrete GPUs, um, but integrated GPUs are, are not the worst. So the scores I got for this are about half of an RX 580, which is what I used to VR game on when I first got the Delve Index. So maybe? Um, turns out that that's actually a no, at least in Windows. So I have Steam installed, Steam VR installed, drivers for this guy, drivers for Intel, etc. And it seems like there is some sort of incompatibility between the Intel XE graphics driver and Steam VR. And it doesn't seem specific to integrated graphics, it's just that until Intel started making discrete graphics, nobody was trying to play virtual reality on Intel integrated. So it shouldn't be a technological problem, it's a driver problem. 
That means my options now are to give up on trying to pressure this thing into playing VR, or trying Ubuntu Linux with Valve's official Steam VR dev packages for Ubuntu, uh, Kubuntu, by the way, so I need KDE instead of GNOME, or the third option is to try Arch. Um, I'm sure you guys in the comments are going to be trying to tell me to install Arch, but I'm going to go down the Ubuntu path. I've got a second SSD in here, so I can install Ubuntu on a second SSD, see if that works for VR, and uh, go from there. So a bit disappointed I couldn't actually run VR on this thing. I was kind of hoping to do that, actually. Um, but for some comparison, the TimeSpy benchmark I ran shows that this thing is about 15% faster in GPU and like two and a half to three times faster in CPU than a Steam Deck. So I think that's probably a good point of comparison. So this has got a heck of a lot more CPU power and roughly equivalent graphics power to a nice handheld. So let's tear this thing down and see what's inside. So I've already shown you guys this nice bottom access cover. But aside from that, how do I actually open this thing? So it looks like there's two pieces of metal that come together here. I've got one single screw I could get to here, and I got nothing else. I've also got two mounting holes here that I didn't catch earlier for like a vase mount, or you could hang it from a wall with one of these guys. So let's take this plate off and see what we got. So I have access to everything I would ever need to access on this system just through this panel. So the NVMEs and the RAM, nothing else is user accessible. Um, but I don't see where any other screws are. So I can look under this foot and there's no screw under there. So the only other fasteners I can find, there's a tiny little screw here, probably holds this plate on, and then this is a thumb screw. So it's tight, so I can't do it by hand, but I can get a screwdriver in here and loosen the thumb screw. It's captive, so it's not coming out. So then there's two pieces of metal here that slide over each other. So if I pull on it, there we go. This comes right off. Very easy to access. I gotta say, this is one of the nicest mini PC cases I have worked with. So there's one captive thumb screw to take this top off. They had one manual screw on the bottom as well. I use a screwdriver for that because it's a bit tight, but uh, super easy to get into this stuff. Okay, so inside here we have the Wi-Fi slot. So this will be our Intel proprietary CNVI. There's the AX210 that runs off to the two antennas. Um, underneath the cooling solution we'll have the CPU, which I probably can't get a good view at. I don't know, can you guys see it in there? Not really. So pretty much just have this one board that has literally everything mounted on it. I do wonder what these pads are for here. I wonder if this is like a footprint for PCI Express. Because down here we can see some high speed differential pairs. I don't know if you can see those there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight high speed differential pairs that run over to this area over here and appear unpopulated. So that could be eight more lanes of PCI Express. Maybe they're planning some model where they swap out the high speed NVMe for a graphics slot or something. I don't know, but keep an eye on that. Also here we have this daughter card slot. Um, a riser board, I guess. So we've got one HDMI and a COM port. And again, the COM port's a really weird choice to me. Um, but it looks like they're actually carrying PCI Express here. So this says CN3 PCIe. So this is somehow PCIe on a cable, which if that was some sort of standard pinout, that would probably make people very happy. But that's running off to the serial chip, which is on PCI Express is this guy down here, and you probably can't read anything because it's super tiny. Um, and that's probably some sort of line driver for the RS-232. As for why this is over here, so it looks like this is DisplayPort, and so then this chip is doing HDMI driving from the DisplayPort signal that comes off the CPU. And so we get DisplayPort and PCI Express, which would be super handy to have on a riser card slot. Um, just that RS-232 is kind of a weird use of a PCI Express. Now that I'm complaining about RS-232, it just seems like kind of a, a waste of a PCI Express lane. There could be better things we could do with that. So that's basically it. There's just this one board here. I'll post a little daughter card. If we look down the slot here, I don't see anything else. I can see a backing plate in there for the CPU cooler. So the CPU cooler screws onto this board with a backing plate. And then this board has screws on the corner that secure it to the case. 
and they've got the nice easy access cover on the back to get to all the stuff you're going to use or hot swap. If you need to open it for some reason, that's also really easy. There's not a lot of stuff you're going to swap around in here. Hello, Danny. Want to come up here? No? Okay. So anyway, as I was saying, there's uh, not a lot you would need to change up here. I guess you could change this Wi-Fi card out for a, a Wi-Fi 6E card for 6 gigahertz if you wanted. And so that's pretty much it for the hardware for the GM Tech K10. So by making this thing not like terribly small, I'm not sure exactly how many fractions of liters this is, but this looks like a, uh, a normal tiny mini micro size machine. It's got essentially one of the highest end mobile chips Intel made in the 13th gen. So it's pretty performant. It's got pretty good integrated graphics. This would be a fantastic workstation if you needed it for that. Um, that's what I think, I guess. But they've also been able to make this really, really accessible. The case is easy to remove with one thumb screw. There's a nice easy access area on the bottom for your RAM and your SSDs. And it's just, it's super easy to work on. And a lot of mini PCs, I think, sacrifice some of that ease to packs to fit a lot more dense. And of course, depending on what you're doing, that might be good or bad for you. If you're going to put this on your TV, if you're going to game on it, if you're going to use it as a desktop for video editing, something like that, you probably don't care if it's a little bit larger. If you're going to mount it up behind the TV, mount it behind your monitor, this will definitely fit just fine. Um, if you're trying for something really small, then maybe cramming more stuff in would make sense, I guess. Now, I am curious where GMK Tech is going to go with this. It does look like there's pads for an unpopulated PCI Express here. There's some more here too, which I think are actually COM ports, or one's USB. So we got some front panel and some COM ports. So it looks like this board could go into some other application as well. Maybe it does already and I just haven't found it, but this board has some unpopulated stuff on it that maybe they'll populate in a future version, or maybe they just got an off the shelf board, I don't know. And finally, price. So I looked this thing up on the GMK Tech website just a few hours ago. It's selling for somewhere in the range of $550 to $600 for this guy as I have it kitted out. One terabyte PCIe Gen 4 SSD made by Crucial, Micron, and 16 gigs of dual channel DDR5 memory. So that's not a bad spec. This is a pretty high-end processor for only five, six hundred bucks. Um, that's a few hundred dollars cheaper than like the Minis Forum MS01, MSA2, MSA1, those family. I did not have any issues with this guy at all in my testing today, except for Intel driver deficiencies, but that's not these guys specifically that applies to all Intel graphics cards for VR. And considering my experience with Minis Forum was significantly worse, if you watch my Minis Forum video, I, I like this guy. So this is definitely a contender to kick out one of the PCs I was thinking of bringing to Finland. Um, if it could do VR, it definitely would, but uh, maybe not. So we'll see how that goes. If you guys want to buy one, I'll have links down in the description below. If you want to chat with me, I have a Discord server link down below for that as well. If you guys want to give me a tip, I greatly appreciate those. I have a Kofi. It's kind of like a Patreon, but it's only a one-time donation. Thanks for those as well. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next adventure.